Good evening, everyone. Time for another update. This is the daily chart of silver versus the US dollar. So you can see that we are preparing a breakout. Uh, this breakout will take us through $28 and hopefully $30. How important is this technical area? You can see this area here. This is the top that was established with the run to $50 from about $5. So it's about a tenfold move in silver back in 2011. The powers that be, the Wall Street banksters, shysters, criminals, pinstripe bandits, managed to cap that with the machinations I covered on my channel, a thousand different videos. So why am I doing a video now? Well, I'm doing a video now because the situation has changed with we now have Wall Street bets. I'm going to get into that, um, what that's about, but before I do that, I want to establish some credibility, why um, I have credibility in this space. So let's go over to the Bitcoin chart. And you can see that Bitcoin is at 33,959. This is a weekly chart. Um, if you pull in and then scroll across, you can follow the history of it. So when did I start telling you about Bitcoin? I started telling you about Bitcoin when it was roughly $3. Back, keep going. back around in here. So I started my silver channel on YouTube in 2010 roughly. Started talking about Bitcoin in 2011. So I pretty much was convinced of Bitcoin and what it was going to do when it was three bucks. Told people about it, it's now 10,000 times that price, yeah, 30,000, roughly 10 times that, uh, 10,000 times that price. Percentage gain, I don't know what they said, a million percentage gain? Yeah, I think that's a million percent. Anyway, so again, just to establish credibility, I'm gonna take you to, here's the silver for the people blog. This is the blog that I started. Um, that you can see this is a capture from 2011 and this was the motto of silver for the people physical silver is the stake in the hearts of the financial vampires physical silver is the bullet that slays the Wall Street werewolves that was my silver blog my Bitcoin blog was the Bitcoin channel which I started Roughly in, I started the YouTube channel in 2011. The blog I started later, but you can see here from the blog, of one of the early entries that's in the web archive was uh, from 2013, and you can see that the price of Bitcoin was about 50 bucks. It had dipped down below 40 at that point. The motto of this channel right here cryptocurrencies will destroy the banksters monopoly on money. So was I right? I think I was. Now let's review some videos. This is a video from December 22nd, 2010 called Crash JP Morgan by Silver. Listen to a little bit of that. And instead take delivery of real silver. Why it can work. There is very little silver in the real world because it has been consumed since the world began using electric things since the end of World War II. Silver is the Achilles heel, the weakest link of the financial world. Silver is the most manipulated market in history. Bankers manipulate it through selling excessive futures contracts and manipulating media, schools, and textbooks because they have to. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, Bix Weir and his vision. Uh, this is what Bix thinks is going to happen. We've arrived at a point in our nation's history that will define how our future will unfold. 
there are only two roads left to take. The first road continues our relentless pursuit of power, control, and manipulation that can only spell the destruction, spell destruction in our future. Destruction of our liberties, destruction of our prosperity, destruction of our moral compass. For too long, our controllers have lied, cheated, and stolen their way to the top only to discover that we the people have been left behind. The second road completely destroys the global fiat monetary system, erasing all forms of false wealth, false power, and false governance. It is truly a creative destruction event that has never been witnessed in the history of mankind. All paper and electronic forms of wealth will evaporate in the blink of an eye, completely leveling the playing field in order to rebuild our monetary structures from the ground up. It is a lesson to be learned the hard way, but is a necessary lesson in order to create a new future for our country. A future built on hard work, complete honesty, and goodwill towards others. Down this road, our Founding Fathers' ideals patiently await our return. So that was Crash J.P. Morgan by Physical Silver. Now I'm going to be talking about why Wall Street Bets is... Well, they're on the right path, but they're on the wrong path because they don't understand the bankers and how devious and criminal they really are. They're going to find out, and they're starting to find out now with Robin Hood and uh, how they've limited them to one share. They've limited what they can buy. They've limited what they can withdraw or transfer. You'll have to follow that on the boards. But I want to take you over to 4 chans biz board, and that's probably where a lot of the Wall Street bets is on Reddit. Probably won't be on Reddit much longer. Um, who owns Reddit? I maybe the Chinese. I don't know. But it's probably not going to be there much longer. But it may be on 4chan. Who runs 4chan? I don't know. The FBI. You tell me. But this is a post that just went on to 4chan. That's talking about silver because basically to explain to you what has happened is that the Wall Street bets crowd has discovered silver and the GameStop game stonks thing was that they had discovered that uh, hedge funds were short uh, more than the float basically the float of the stock is the amount of stock that's out there for the public to buy and the evil shorts on Wall Street, the hedge funds, had been playing a game for a very long time, shorting companies into bankruptcy. Now, with this corona hoax or whatever this thing is, uh, I think it's just a petrodollar reset, um, worldwide petrodollar reset that's behind that. But I'm not going to go into, you know, this whole lockdown and all this nonsense that's going on. By the way, don't, don't get vaccine, vaccinated. That goes without saying. Anyway... Um, so this is a big scare thing. Listen to this. This is a guy who posted this on uh, 4chan. I work for a bank whose name I won't disclose. You fools. You have no idea what you're doing. No idea how serious this is. This isn't a simple get-rich-quick scheme. If there's a short squeeze on silver, all the banks will fail. Every single one. Eight of them are short silver, and they would have to pay trillions to cover shorts if silver got into triple digits. The entire financial system will be destroyed if you do this. Silver is to the banks what GME is to Melvin Capital. Is this what you want to happen? I did say, yeah. When we're in the middle of a pandemic, if the banks fall apart, you'll wipe out every single person who is holding dollars. Yeah, I think they want that. A lot of these guys uh, are jobless, homeless, some of them. They're saying, well, you know, this is a joker thing for them. Come join us. Uh, what the hell is wrong with you? America will be destroyed. No, I don't think America will be destroyed, but the dollar will be destroyed. If you do this, don't think that we won't take away your silver as we disabled your manipulated short squeeze stocks. You un-American traders, you've been warned. So that's a pretty big scare uh, post on 4chan. But back to what I was talking about, I want to try to continue to establish some credibility here. So this is a video that I posted for the Extra Normal cartoon series about Bitcoin. You can see this is June 16th, 2011. This is roughly when I discovered Bitcoin. 
And this is the video that I did about Bitcoin, so I'm going to play a little bit of this. Well, I see you're working very late tonight. Saving up to buy more physical silver? No. Actually, I'm staying late setting up a server farm to mine Bitcoins. Bitcoins. What are Bitcoins? Bitcoins are a new peer-to-peer, -peer, encrypted, digital currency which has no central authority and a fixed supply. You said you are mining Bitcoins. What does that mean? Bitcoins are designed to be similar to gold and silver. It requires effort to produce them. With Bitcoins the work is done by computers. How can a computer mine something? Bitcoins are mined by computers by running complex math calculations. The Bitcoins are awarded on the basis of a lottery with a chance of winning increasing relative to hashing power. But won't the world end up being flooded with Bitcoins? No. There is a fixed number that will ever be produced. No more than 21 million can ever exist. How can they enforce that? Because the network is peer-to-peer. -peer. So every node in the network is aware of every coin and every transaction. So what? What's to stop them from being counterfeited? They cannot be counterfeited because all bitcoins must be verified by the existing nodes. Fake bitcoins would be quickly rejected by the network. But what is backing bitcoins? What gives them value? Why do bitcoins need to be backed by anything? Let me ask you. What is gold backed with? That's a silly question. Gold is gold. It is not backed by anything. Then why does it have value? Gold has value because it is rare. Gold cannot be counterfeited. Gold is a store of value. Gold is portable and divisible. Lastly, gold has value because people desire it for all of the above reasons. So if bitcoins are rare, cannot be counterfeited, are a store of value, portable, divisible, and people value them. Why do they have to be backed by anything? Well, since you put it that way, I guess they don't. But if people don't value them, then how can they have any worth? The fact is that people are very rapidly starting to value them. Their price has risen in dollar term from 6 cents to 32 dollars in less than a year. But is that legal? How can there be a digital currency that governments don't control? There is nothing illegal about bitcoins because no law on the books says anything about them. But can't people use them for illegal purposes? Yes. So what? Anything can be used for illegal purposes. Do you think that anyone has ever paid for illegal items using cash, or even gold for that matter? Of course. Then does that make gold or cash evil? Of course not. Not even an imbecile would believe that. So you can see that trying to smear bitcoins is really just an effort to discredit them by the people who hate them. Hate them? Why would anybody hate them? Banksters. Banksters hate them because they cut the banks out. How do they cut the banks out? Banks take a piece of every digital transaction because they charge fees to process them. Bitcoin's only processing fee is voluntary, and it ends up going back to the system in the next coins awarded. How's that? Because Bitcoin miners are also the processes of the transactions. So any fees awarded, which are tiny, are paid out to the miners who are keeping the system running. So evil banksters and government leeches don't get a penny from the system? Correct. Well if that's the case then won't they try to stop it? They probably will, but since the coins are free to go anywhere in the world, they will have a very difficult time of it. How well has big media succeeded in stopping BitTorrent? Good point. So I guess they may have to allow it or be left behind. Either way, it is going to be very interesting to watch. True that. Kick back and pop some popcorn and watch the show. Popcorn? In here? Yeah. Just set some over on those T6990 video cards. It will be done in no time. Lols. So that was nearly 10 years ago when I told you about Bitcoin. Now the Bitcoin is the thirty to forty thousand dollar range. A lot of people who are in this crowd, Wall Street bets, are crypto millionaires. Maybe I don't know. Hopefully, a lot of you are. Hopefully, a lot of you kept your crypto and paper wallets, etc. Um, and 
they are talking about shifting to silver. Now we know that silver is the biggest short in the history of the world. It's the most manipulated uh, investment in the history of the world. And it is their Achilles heel. There's no question about that. Uh, it, it can't be doubted. So what happens if these Bitcoin investors and Wall Street bet people, GameStop people, apparently a lot of the people in GameStop have made a lot of money. I don't know. Uh, they may get their money out. They probably won't get their money out. And uh, what happens if they shift a significant portion of that wealth into physical silver? Well, I think we're going to see uh, there is some significant activity in SLV. There is activity. This is a chart of AG. This is First Majestic. There was a breakout in First Majestic uh, Friday. You can see the breakout on decent volume. So these people do appear to be piling into silver. Um, and it's also confirmed in the silver chart if we get through this price. So why am I making this video? Well, I'm making this video uh, to explain to people who are considering this concept that physical silver is silver for the people. Uh, this concept is that the billionaires who control the system, governments, media, all the rest of them, they can't buy silver. There isn't enough silver. Um, uh, the calculations I did when I started were based on three, five, ten dollars silver and uh, the rough mining amounts, say three quarters of a billion ounces. Back then we were talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Now with silver, let's just say silver is 30 bucks and let's say just by a miracle they can mine a hundred or a billion ounces, that's 30 billion bucks. Again. I don't even know if we're paying that much interest per day on the debt. So, again, this, this strategy of very small players uh, attacking by buying small amounts, uh, attacking the fake financial system by stacking physical silver, this strategy can work and will work. Now, hopefully that I've established credibility regarding telling you about silver beforehand, telling you about Bitcoin. Nearly 10 years ago, people will listen to what I'm saying now about Wall Street bets. Now, I've talked for many years about Jesse Livermore. For those of you who don't know, you need to get Jesse Livermore's Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. This is on Project Gutenberg. You can uh, find it in PDF form or wherever. Uh, it was written at the turn of the century. So it's a, it's a book that's over 100 years old. I believe it's in the public domain anyway. But Livermore was, in my mind, indisputably the greatest trader of all time. Now, he was Livermore was different than Jay Gould, the guy who said, uh, he who sells what isn't his and must buy it back or go to prison. That's a situation that uh, Melvin Capital's in right now with GameStop. But uh, Livermore was not an insider. He was not like Rockefeller, the uh, people of his time who had money. He was actually just a kid. He was called the boy, boy plunger. He, was a, he, he created technical analysis basically single-handedly. And he recognized that price action could predict future behavior in markets. And consequently, he, or uh, sorry, subsequently he... Uh, made millions, lost millions, etc. But he wrote a book called Operations uh, of a Stock Operator, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, and he gave his wisdom. Now this wisdom here I'm going to read to you is about Wall Street. And they have always been, the Wall Street banks, Wall Street, uh, the financial system, they're a bunch of criminals. They've always been a bunch of criminals. Now uh, they, is fluctuated to how corrupt it has been. You know, the SEC was created back at, during the Depression and Joseph Kennedy, notorious stock plunger, uh, was the first head of it. So that tells you right there, you know, that uh, 
it, even the SEC, they're all corrupt. But uh, the strategy here that Livermore was using was to use technical analysis to make profits in the markets. And the markets uh, go fluctuate in the amount of corruption that's in them. At this point in time, Livermore was dealing with a trade that he made in the commodities markets, which are, by the way, they're going to become uh, very important again here. We're starting to see that in the grains and everything else. But I'm going to read you this to show you the point that they will change the rules on you. They will cheat you. You cannot beat them at their game. If you play in the house, you know, if it's like a casino in Vegas, if you walk in, then the rules are the house always wins. Um, you can win occasionally. You can maybe count cards or something, or you can find something that gives you an edge, and maybe you can develop a little system where you can make a little more, bit of money. But trust me, once they find out that you are taking money from them, they will kick you out. They will ban you. This is what happened to Livermore. So let's read this, and then we're going to apply this to Wall Street bets and what's happening. Among the hazards of speculation, the happening of the unexpected, I might even say of the unexpectable, ranks high. There are certain chances that the most prudent man is justified in taking, chances that he must take if he wishes to be more than a mercantile mollusk. Normal business hazards are no worse than the risks a man runs when he goes out of his house into the street or sets out on a railroad journey. When I lose money by reason of some development which nobody could foresee, I think no more vindictively of it than I do of an inconveniently timed storm. Life itself, from the cradle to the grave, is a gamble, and what happens to me because I do not possess the gift of second sight I can bear undisturbed. But there have been many times in my career as a speculator when I have both been right and played square, and nevertheless, I've been cheated out of my earnings by the sordid unfairness of unsportsmanlike opponents. That's going to happen to Wall Street bets. Mark my words. Against misdeeds by crooks, cowards, and crowds, a quick-thinking or far-sighted businessman can protect himself. I've never gone up against downright dishonesty, except in a bucket shop or two. Now, let me stop here. A bucket shop, if you've read Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, was where Livermore started and made his beginning stake of money by trading stocks. A bucket shop is called a bucket shop because they bucket trades. So this was a place where people would go in and buy a certain number of shares of stock and then they'd play the market. It was kind of like, like a little casino for stocks. Now, the reason why bucket shops were unethical, there were supposedly legitimate bucket shops, but the vast majority of bucket shops were illegitimate. And the reason why they're called a bucket shop is because they would bucket trades. What that term means is that what they, when you... When you had a whole bunch of customers who went along a railroad, for example, which was big in Livermore's day, the bucket shop was supposed to telegraph or wire to the exchange the number of buys and keep their books straight. But they were called a bucket shop because they would actually bucket the trades. What that means is they wouldn't place those trades on the exchange. they just simply keep those trades within house and try to balance the shorts versus the longs. And if they needed to, Livermore talked about how they'd have a bucket shop drive, they'd try to wipe them out. They were on thin margin. Their tickets were based on debt. So they were easy to wipe out with a run up or down. So the bucket shop was a dishonest gambling operation that bucketed the trades of the traders and didn't actually place them on the exchange. So the big question here, and I think it's coming out now, is Robinhood a bucket shop? Because what's happened with Robinhood and GameStop is that uh, they're claiming they may be insolvent, or it's implied they may be insolvent. There's a lot of things going on. But what would explain better than anything else I've seen so far is that it's possible that all the GameStop trades were actually bucketed by Robinhood. In other words, they didn't actually buy the stock. They just told their customers they have it in their account. 
if that is true, if that's what they did, then they were in essentially in a synthetic short position. It means that Robinhood was short GameStop. Even though their customers were long the stock, if they didn't go and purchase it on the exchange, then they became short the stock. And we can go into that. That I'm sure that's being discussed endlessly, but let's continue with the story. In a bucket shop or two, because even their honesty was the best policy, the big money was in being square and not welshing. I've never thought a good business to play any game in any place where it was necessary to keep an eye on the dealer because he was likely to cheat if unwatched. But against the whining Welsher, the decent man is powerless. Now this is what we're seeing with the hedge funds. These are whining Welshers. These are people who lost at a fair game and now they're whining and they're gonna cheat. Fair play is fair play. I can tell you a dozen instances where I've been the victim of my own belief in the sacredness of the pledged word or the inviolability of a gentleman's agreement. I shall not do so here because no useful purpose can be served thereby. Fiction writers, clergymen, and women are fond of alluding to the floor of the stock exchange as a boodler's battlefield and to Wall Street's daily business as a fight. It's quite dramatic but utterly misleading. I do not think that my business is strife and contest. I never fight either individuals or speculative cliques. I merely differ in opinion. That is, in my reading of basic conditions. What playwrights call battles of business are not fights between human beings. They're merely tests of business vision. I try to stick to the facts and facts only and govern my actions accordingly. That is Bernard M. Baruch's recipe for success in wealth winning. Sometimes, I do not see the facts, all the facts, clearly enough or early enough, or else I do not reason logically. Whenever any of these things happen, I lose. I'm wrong. It always costs me money to be wrong. No reasonable man objects to paying for his mistakes. There are no preferred creditors in mistake making and no exceptions or exemptions. But I object to losing money when I am right. I do not mean either those deals that have cost me money because of sudden changes in the rules of some particular exchange. I have in mind certain hazards of speculation that from time to time remind a man that no profit should be counted safe until it is deposited in your bank to your credit. And let me add this, until it is deposited in physical silver in your possession. This is where we're going. After the Great War broke out in Europe, there began the rise of the price of commodities that was to be expected. It was as easy to foresee that as to foresee war inflation. Of course. The general advance continued as the war prolonged itself, as you may remember. I was busy coming back in 1915. The boom in stocks was there and it was my duty to utilize it. My safest, easiest, and quickest big play was in the stock market and I was lucky, as you know. By July 1917, I not only had been able to pay off all my debts, but it was quite a little to the good besides. This meant that I now had time the money and inclination to consider trading in commodities as well as in stocks. For many years, I had made it my practice to study all the markets in advance, study all the markets, the, the advance in commodity prices over the pre-war level, sorry, the advance in commodity prices over the pre-war level ranged from 100 to 400%. There was only one exception and that was coffee. Of course, there was a reason for this, the breaking out of the war meant the closing up of the European markets and huge cargoes were sent to this country, which was the one big market. That led in time to an enormous surplus of raw coffee here, and that in turn kept the price low. Why, when I first began to consider its speculative possibilities, coffee was actually selling below pre-war prices. If the reasons for this anomaly were plain, no less plain was it that the active and increasingly efficient operation by the German and Austrian submarines must mean an appalling reduction in the number of ships available for... And I'm, I'm not going to continue reading this, but you should read this yourself. Uh, but I'm going to summarize the rest of it. So basically, Livermore was long coffee. And the reason why was he foresaw that there would be a, a significant rise in prices and a possible failure to deliver the physical commodity to the to North America, which primarily came from South America because of the war uh, and U-boats and sinking of ships, etc. And he made a, a bet, a big coffee bet. And what ultimately happened was that his uh, opponents, we'll say, 
but they're actually just people on the other side of the trade. They took the other side of the bet. They were short coffee, and Livermore was long coffee. Well, of course, Livermore was right, and prices began to rise, then prices began to spike, uh, something similar <laughs> to what we see in, uh, in the markets now. And what happened was, because they were losing so badly, because they were facing potential bankruptcy, because they were short something they shouldn't have been short of, they made a really stupid bet, as you can see here, like with GameStop, where people actually shorted more than the float. Um, what they did was they ran to Congress and they convinced Congress to pass a war profiteering act and they unilaterally reversed the trade and Jesse Livermore didn't make a penny, even though he should have made millions of dollars. So he was playing fair. Okay, so now hopefully you can see the uh, analogy here. These people who were buying GameStop, they were playing fair. Now let me defend them here with these accusations of pump and dump because people are saying that it was a pump and dump. Uh, and you can see they started accumulating GameStop back around here when it was... Um, actually, they started accumulating it... Uh, yeah, it was like ten under 10 bucks, maybe 4 bucks. So back in December. Now, they're being accused of running a pump and dump. Let me briefly explain a pump and dump scheme. And a pump and dump scheme is technically illegal, or at least it's prosecutable. A pump and dump scheme is a stock, stock manipulation game where people who, traditionally they've been run on stock boards, etc., but people who are, have invested in usually a worthless stock, so a company that has no value at all, a penny stock, for example, they will accumulate a lot of the stock, they will go onto a message board, and they will drum up support for that stock. And then they will create a giant uh, buzz about a particular company and get a lot of people to follow them, buy the stock. And when the people are buying the stock and it's spiking up, say something like this spike here, then they will sell into that spike. Their intention is to unload their cheaply bought shares onto new suckers. Now, that is being alleged that what is happening in GameStop. That is not what is happening in GameStop. People are not buying GameStop because they think the price is going to go higher so they can dump it on someone else. The actual original vision behind buying GameStop was that the shorts had shorted more stock than is in the float. And what that means is that if you short a stock, you have to borrow it to sell it, and then you owe the stock. You got, you got money for selling the stock, but you owe the stock. So if the stock goes up in price, you have to actually spend more than you got for selling it and you lose. If the stock goes down, then you can buy it back cheaper than you sold it for and you win. So shorting a stock is a way of borrowing a stock to sell it and profit on its decline. That's what the hedge funds were doing. That's what Wall Street bets bet against. So uh, they had a fundamental reason to buy GameStop. The fundamental reason was that the shorts had shorted more than exists. And therefore, uh, as Daniel Drew said, uh, he who sells what isn't hisn must buy it back or go to prison. At least that's the way it's always been. Watch him change the rules. So the, the Wall Street hedge funds got themselves upside down by trying to drive GameStop into bankruptcy. Now, probably the... Wall Street Bets crowd figured this out because if GameStop was going to go bankrupt, it probably should have gone bankrupt during the pandemic, and it didn't. You can see it bottomed here around four bucks. It should have gone bankrupt in the summer. It should have gone bankrupt uh, in July, but it didn't. So something was up. So some of these people smelled blood in the water and thought, wait a minute, if it's not going to go bankrupt, if these shorts can't drive it into bankruptcy, then what is going to happen? Well, let's start buying it. So that, that's the story so far. Now, what is happening with Robin Hood and what is happening with the various brokers? And this is what I warned about 
and this is what I am warning about, is they are actively changing the rules. They will change the rules. This is the casino. When you walk into a casino in Las Vegas, there isn't a big sign that says, if you win, we will kick you out, right? The whole draw of a casino is that you can get lucky and win. And that's obviously why people gamble. They like to have some spare money they want to risk and they think, well, I might double my money, I might get lucky, or I'll just have fun. But if you have a plan to win, and it's a winning plan, and you go into the casino and you start winning, and you start winning consistently, they're going to kick you out. They're going to change the rules. They're going to ban you for life. That's Wall Street. That's the Wall Street criminal cabal. So to sum up, we have a situation now where a lot of the crypto profits and a lot of the GameStop profits have been told about silver. Silver is the greatest short. Silver is the greatest manipulation. Um, it's their Achilles heel. If they lose the silver battle, they lose it all. We've known this for many, many years. Silver stackers have known this for many, many years. Now, unlike others, I told you about Bitcoin when it was a couple bucks and I examined it thoroughly and concluded that it was a decentralized currency. It was a new thing that had never existed before. You know the story, you know what's happened. So a lot of the people who made a ton of money on cryptocurrencies, a lot of the people who made a ton of money on GameStop and these others are starting to look at physical silver. This is the next big play. We're starting to see volume that indicates that this may happen. So if this does happen, trust me, it is going to be the biggest blowout. I hope you have your paper wallets of your Bitcoin and all your other cryptocurrencies off of the exchanges. I hope you have your physical silver in your possession because if this does come to pass, like this guy warned, um, yeah, it's the end of the Western financial system. Now, supposedly back in the fall of 2019, there was a huge crisis in the derivatives market anyway, and that it is speculated that that's what the whole pandemic was about. Who would have guessed they would have been able to put this thing worldwide and, but, if their system truly was going to collapse and they foresaw that their system was going to collapse and they foresaw that their power and control was going to disappear, then wouldn't they try to front run that? Wouldn't they try to set up a system of control? Wouldn't they try to prepare a mark of the beast type system where you cannot buy or sell without being a part of the system? I think they would. So I think that indicates that Bitcoin isn't a part of that. Now, a type of cryptocurrency may be the mark of the beast system. And uh, just to conclude here, uh, I know a lot of you have made a lot of money off cryptocurrencies. I know a lot of you made a lot of money off of silver or at least have stacked a lot of silver. You haven't made your money yet. It's coming. But, uh, you know, what does your money do for you in the long run? Well, it makes you comfortable, gives you the ability to help somebody, but you're not taking it with you. You're not taking crypto with you and you're not taking silver with you. You're not taking anything with you. As Job said, uh, naked came I into this world and uh, naked am I going out of this world. So you're going out of this world naked. You could die tomorrow. And if you have not trusted Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for you on the cross, when he died for your sins and rose from the dead on the third day, and you don't believe that, then it's all for naught. You're not taking anything out of this place. And uh, is this the mark of the beast system? No, but it's a test run. They're getting ready. It's getting set up. You better get your King James Bible. You better start reading it. If you haven't been saved yet, get saved. Trust Jesus. He died for you. He rose from the dead. All you have to do is believe it and you're saved forever. Trust him, and we'll talk to you next time.